So let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here with you to talk about Rust, Python, and open source, uh, three topics that are really uh, uh, interested in. So let me introduce myself first. I'm Florian Vallée. I'm a staff data engineer working at Back Market. Back Market is a global um, uh, de refurbished devices, uh, such as smartphones, a uh, global marketplace for smartphones and, um, and laptop. And uh, additionally to my role at uh, Back Market, I'm also a maintainer in the Delta IRS, uh, which is a Delta library uh, for the Delta Lake ecosystem. Before uh, knowing more about Python and Rust and the combination of, of both, I would like to introduce a bit what is Delta Lake and what is Delta IRS. So Delta Lake is an open source technology uh, under the Linux Foundation, and uh, it was created by Databricks, uh, which are the creator of, of Apache uh, Spark. And basically, Delta Lake aims to provide reliability, performance, and quality on, on data lakes. And you can think about, uh, basically, a protocol with two main concepts. The first one is a scalable transaction log, and the second one is a scalable storage. So you have the scalable transaction log that keep tracking all the data files which are written in Parquet in the scalable storage. So it can be used on several cloud providers such as AWS S3 or GCP with cloud storage, for example. So bringing availability to data lakes, um, it was to improve the, the scalability of the data and the metadata management, but also to break down walls between data warehouse and, and data lakes. Uh, it provides more features like the, the order to optimize the data storage that we can find to improve uh, the readability and the access for analytical uh, purposes. Delta Lake was really GVM oriented. It means that it was really focused on the Java programming language uh, because it was written on top of Apache Spark, which is in Scala. That's why when you need to use Delta Lake, you have to be running an Apache Spark cluster and to use Delta Lake on top. So it was really focusing on the Delta protocol and this design choice led to have multiple connectors in the Java programming language with a common uh, Hadoop ecosystem like uh, Hive or, or, or the different libraries that you can find. Of course, when you need to run a cluster, sometimes you don't need to have billions of data. You need a small portion of the delta tables, and maybe you want to trigger some actions that do not require to bootstrap like a big cluster with a lot of expensive resources. Um, that's why at back market, our first need was to uh, only access a delta table only on the metadata provided and to trigger some action in, in Python. So we were not using quite much the, the cluster and we don't have to spin up a cluster. We also have different scenarios when we are event-based and we would like to use only small resources like an AWS Lambda that could handle the, the processing part. Or you can think about small use cases like data science topic that you want just to read and to access and to explore a, a bit a, a small portion of your delta tables. And I can deny that uh, Rust was, was also uh, the part of Delta IRS is Rust, and it was really an excellent choice uh, for the data processing because it's really reliable and, and performant on the data processing storage. And also, it was a way for us to open a gate to incorporate more data processing tools like Polars or, or, or Arrow, and also to provide a good way to uh, create embeddings with Python bindings and to open a new gateway with other data ecosystem uh, library like, um, like AWS Panda SDK or DuckDB, for, for instance. And right now, uh, Databricks and open source communities are thinking about re-implementing a bit uh, the Delta kernel to have like a core function and to not reinvent the wheel to connect uh, a lot of libraries. Delta IRS was built organically with an open source community, but we have to re-implement a lot of part of the protocol, so re-engineering a lot of things. So right now, they are thinking about providing Delta kernel in Rust, but also in Java to make the life of development process easier to connect more connectors. 
And I would say we, we were not the only one. Um, we have a lot of different uh, Python libraries that are doing the same. We have, can think about PyDantic Core that re-implement PyDantic in version two by re, uh, rewriting everything on the core in Rust. They, they have like a 17 times faster uh, library thanks to this. And we can think about Polars, which is the last blazing data frame uh, structure to improve a bit the, the exploration on this side as well. And there is also Arrow and Arrow Data Fusion that are really helpful to manage the in-memory data that you can process a lot. So it's really powerful when you need to, to collect, process, and uh, analyze the data sets. And for the fifth consecutive years, uh, Rust uh, has uh, won the, the heart of the developers by being the most, uh, the most loved programming language. A bit of history, um, so it was written in Rust uh, at first and it was created by Script at the beginning in 2020. And Backmarket joined the, and the open source uh, efforts to provide and to improve the Python binding. It was really important to have well-defined, well-documented Python bindings to improve uh, the connectivity with, uh, to other libraries. So the, the layers was already there, but we joined the effort to improve it. And right after uh, re releasing the first version and to improve the Python bidding, we saw an, a significant increase in terms of number of, of download in PyPy. It was really impressive because a lot of different uh, Python data uh, processing tools integrate Delta ARS uh, by the Python binding, so they really help and really uh, uh, increase the, the usage of uh, Delta ARS. So right now we are more than 100 contributors and uh, a lot of contribution is done about Delta RS in Python and, and Rust as well. So best of both worlds, uh, Rust and Python, how to combine them. But before, uh, I would like to talk more about why not C or C++. Um, Mozilla, with the employee of Graydon O, created Rust uh, to mitigate the common uh, challenge that we have when we are programming with low native uh, programming language like C. It can be um, new pointers, buffers, overflows, and a lot of data racist conditions. So it was, Rust was really the answer to face uh, this common issue, but without promising the developer's experience and productivity. So that's why Rust was the best of both worlds in, in this area, because it provides high-level API while providing efficient and reliable uh, um, uh, calls and, uh, and the runtimes. So it was more than by de developed by developers. Uh, if you see Cargo, which is a package manager, it is really well uh, structured and it's really helpful to, to build um, a Rust crate. And Web Engine Servo implementation was done by Mozilla Foundation, but right now Firefox is 10% written in Rust, and, uh, and Servo was another Web Engine uh, application for the browser, but it means that you have a lot of potential in, in this area. And when we talk about Rust, we don't talk, talk uh, about the binding itself. We can think about the bindings, uh, the, the Rust core, but thinking about the, the binding as well. Because you can manage the memory and face this issue again and again about memory management. Uh, but you can think about having the same problem when you need to create bin bindings between two languages. Uh, you can face the same issue. You have two different models of the memory management, so but when you are releasing or creating the memory in one layer, you need to think how to release and, and to manage it on the other layer in the different manners. And Rust is really helpful on, in this because it provides a lot of bindings and libraries to help you uh, to manage this kind of situation. And at the, mean, at the same time, you can, Rust, you can develop in Rust directly and provide a, a good way and a good uh, of uh, reliable uh, software. Coming back to Delta RS, you see the first uh, layer. So it's made with Rust, and basically uh, we use Parquet. So the, all the data were written in Parquet. That's why we fetch and collect everything. We read it, and we convert to uh, arrow uh, uh, columnar oriented uh, in the memory. So it's really efficient because you have a zero copy mechanism, and it's also um, you have no uh, serialization and deserialization at the same time to process your, your data. So it's really efficient. Uh, and we use Tokyo, it's, um, it's just in um, asynchronous uh, a library to help the developer experience. So it's, it quite improves the asynchronous call that you have to make. So you have the performances, you have the safe and reliable software with crates uh, on, on the Rust layer, and you can run uh, this crate uh, 
where, where you, you want on your, on your system. And it's not only to talk about performances with this Rust core uh, script as, a, uh, as saving two orders of magnitude in terms of price just to inc incorporate Rust layer, Delta Lake rate, to improve the, the, the layer and ingestion. So it was really helpful for them to, um, to have this library. We integrate Object Store, uh, which is a part to unify the Happy AI calls from different cloud providers. It was really helpful to have like one simple place and to have a consistent experience in terms of Happy AI when you are dealing with different cloud providers. So it was really helpful to integrate Object Store in the, in the Rust uh, code base. And we see Python, so how we can combine Python and Rust. So we, we use PyO3 and Maturin. The combination of two will help you to create the glue uh, between the two languages. So PyO3 is really helpful in the Rust uh, dependency that you can create to have the Python extension. And Maturin on the other side will help you to define what is uh, the Rust uh, to use and how to use the binding, uh, the underlying bi binding. Uh, so you see you have two layers. The first one is uh, the PyPy library, so you can deploy, you can install it from your Python ecosystem. And on the other side, you can download the crate on crate.io if you want, would like just to have the Rust application. So you have the, the best combination uh, of uh, Python and Rust. On the last point, when you have other dependency, you can, for example, add Panda and have a simple uh, layer, additional layer in the Python bindings and you can plug it with different other data processing tools. So it was simple to integrate Delta Lake and to use it in other data processing solutions. Let's now focus on how uh, to create the Python bindings. So it's really simple. Um, you just have to install Rust on your system and you have a virtual environment to isolate all the Python dependency. And the first step would be just to install Maturin in your, in your uh, environment. The next step will be to scaffold the project. So you will be uh, maturing new pro my project. This is the name of my project. And you will have to choose between different bindings that you would like to use with your Python Rust application. So our focus is PyO3 because it's really helpful when you need to design an API with a lot of constraint, with a lot of complexity. And it also really helps you to define the glue between the languages. But you can think about CFFI or or Recipiton. So Recipiton is not really quite active at the moment, but CFI is more complicated if you need to more, more the memory management between the two, but you can do it easily in the Python if, if your tool is really simple, like a, a simple command line command. Uh, Unify, uh, Unify uh, RS is uh, the, the library of the future, I would say, because it will provide a way to integrate more language with a common definition not only for Python, but for Go and other languages. In the next step, upon generation, you will see that you have your project and the project structure will be uh, separated into two different code bases. The first one will be uh, Rust with a cargo uh, file that will be the cargo, the package manager, or how to, to define the project. On the other part, uh, we have Python. So you have a clear distinction between your Python application and your Rust application. So it's really a best practice to separate the file like this to make sure that you have two different layers and you will be able to, to plug them on, on Python or to use simply uh, the, the Rust application and the, and the Python uh, application on the other side. So let's take a look on the cargo to, to ML file. So um, you have the project uh, defined and you see there is two kind of different instructions. The first one is a crate type which is a C uh, dynamic library. So it's a C convention that you can have a shared library uh, when you're using Mac or Linux, or you can think about a DLL on Windows. And it will be created the glue for you just to make the call from Python to, uh, to, to Rust. So it's really behind the scene, but you, you, it was automatically generated by Matura. And on the feature, you can activate different feature with Rust. Uh, you can think about activating IBI free. If you would like to have a full compatibility uh, in terms of Python language, uh, for example, to have like full compatibility with 3.7 uh, Python, you can just add uh, the extension and you will be uh, compatible when you are creating a software with Rust. On the lib.rs, uh, I just create a few uh, examples on how you can uh, create your bindings and how you can define uh, your Python class. So this one is really simple. 
uh, you have three different instructions. The first one is a, is a macro for the class. So you define a class uh, in Rust, really simple, with two attributes A and B for this example. And you can define as well as the, as the, the Rust tile the, the definition of the method. So it's just pi methods on top. And you will be able to define the constructor and the different de definition for, for, your, for your object. And at the end, you have the pi module instructions that will be your module. So you will be able to create uh, like a, a, a Python module that you can import on, on your Python environment. So this kind of instruction is really simple. And you will see it is, um, it's a macro uh, definition style with, uh, with Rust. And it will be able to generate the glue for you behind the scene uh, that we will see uh, later. So this one is really uh, focusing on creating uh, a Python application, a Python um, uh, structure that you can use, but you can also call uh, Python code. This one is just to have a call from the Python code base to the Rust, but you can do um, uh, also uh, calling different uh, uh, Python structure or, or method if you want. On the Python side, we see uh, a pyproject.toml. So you have like the structure defining for you the build backend as maturin. So it's really simple. You have maturin that dealing the side lib uh, for you and making the, the glue for you behind the scene. On the just structure, just to push, uh, to, to make a link with uh, the, the Python defined in the project. So it's just uh, uh, um, an instruction to say, okay, I, want, I would like to have my library in this folder. Uh, really simple. Uh, for the example, it was just for testing purposes, but you can see that you create uh, a new uh, project in Python, and you just have to import my project, which is the name defined by your module, and I can use my Python Rust class. So it's really simple to import everything, and it's made due to the, the library that will be created by Maturin behind the scene. So in this example, I just create uh, one structure, and I just... Uh, sum up the different attributes, which is uh, the result is free. And if, we, if you would like to improve this API, you can think about defining your own Python class uh, to make sure that you can provide more reliability, but you can import the Rust structure in, inside it and define and, and provide different documentation to make it simple for everyone to use. Just to sum up and to unfold the different phases, uh, the first one is to uh, generate the project. You have everything you saw before with the structure and everything, everything is defined. You can work on the, the Rust uh, software, so the Rust application, or you can work on the Python uh, application and make, and make the glue. The next step will be to, um, to launch Maturin de Develop. Um, it will provide for you a development purpose uh, um, crate, and you generated like a shared library. In my case, it was Mac, so it generated a shared object. And this one could be used to test or to launch and to have the import working well, so you can define your test, uh, uh, improve a bit the development process uh, on the CI or to, to test uh, your Python project. So the next step, you can also, after generating this library and everything configured into the virtual environment, you can also launch the Python example. So at the end, we'll see three, which was one and, and two, and the main uh, definition is the example.pi. If you would like to go uh, further, you will want to build the crate. So it means you, you want to build the wield with, uh, with everything embedded in it into it. That's why you can focus on uh, implementing Maturin Build and Maturin Publish. It will build the wheel for you, and you can publish it into uh, PyPy if you want. In this example, again, we see that we create a dedicated wheel for my environment. So it was um, Python, uh, in specific version of Python. So in your CI process, uh, keep in mind to have a multiple process with different operating system to be sure to create the wheel for a lot of uh, variety of, of, um, of, of uh, machine and, uh, and operating systems. If you want to take a look at what is generated behind, uh, you can install expand, uh, which is an additional uh, dependency on cargo, and you will see uh, the code generation behind the scene. So I really like to develop, but uh, this one is not really um, <laughs> beautiful to, to develop. That's why it's really uh, efficient to have the automatic uh, way of generating the code by using the macro because everything is, is defined and we don't want to, to develop this kind of uh, structure. So we 
talk about Python and Rust. Uh, don't get it up uh, into the, the Python versus Rust uh, showdown, but m basically, if you think about one use case, you can think about reading uh, one billion raw data sets. And you can use Panda for it with a simple CSV format, and it takes three minutes. And if you activate Delta RS and if you go to the Delta tables with a lot of features, you can reach two seconds of, uh, of, uh, of performances. So that's why it's not uh, only about Python and Rust, uh, but it's, it's also Delta table and the zero order optimization. But you can think about a lot of use cases where you need to access quickly to the data for a small portion and you don't want to wait to spin up a cluster and, and wait uh, a lot of time. So basically, my, my learning through this journey is to when you need to think about creating a Python uh, Rust library, you need to think about CPU or memory intensive, and you can create everything into Rust. But you have to be aware about the global interpreter lock that can help the process. So that's why you can also improve it by making, making it uh, fully asynchronous. You can use Pio3 with AsyncQ and be able to call the Rust uh, code base uh, without waiting. So it can be one area of improvement. Um, also, you don't have to think too much about the global interpreter lock when you shared uh, the object between Python and Rust. But if you like to keep memory or to call uh, from Rust uh, the Python code base, you need to think about acquiring the, the global interpreter lock so you can have a memory leak issue or, or, or different topics that you need to look closer. Actually, for the simple use case, it works. But if you have different use cases, with more intensive memory management, you need to, uh, to use smart pointers, which is uh, another topic. Uh, concurrent tests on data sets. Uh, Arrow and Pyro has really have some library if you want to deal with a lot of data processing so solution. It's in memory, it's efficient, and you don't have to serialize and deserialize, and also you can be in the same process. It was really helpful, for example, because we have Arrow on Rust, we use it, we get the schema, and on Pyro with the Python, we be able to read it and to use it in the Python library. So it was really convenient for us to benefit from the two, uh, two libraries. For the Rust part, ownership is key. It's more about the language, but when you are designing something, uh, the ownership and taking care of, of where is the, the, the variables and where the memory is and handle is really nice and really convenient when you deal with a lot of uh, processing in, with big data sets. On the data ecosystem and the friendly API, I think the best uh, combination will be to have the very well-documented and structured Python class with really uh, like a Sphinx documentation, really helpful, and it will really provide a, a, a gateway to the Rust code base. Um, but think also about the will and the usage by providing multiple operating system, uh, good documentations, and also you can activate optional dependency. Optional dependency will be I need only this part of the, the application on my Python, but I could leverage the feature of Rust behind the scene, so it makes sure to have only the, the binaries that you want for your use case. If I take one example, it would be to IWS. I have the optional dependency in Python. I can activate a feature, an optional feature in Rust, and when I'm downloading the, the application, I am really focused on AWS and not GCP, as you for, for instance. So you can think about both when you are developing. And uh, the last point, the Rust uh, community is, uh, is really great. Uh, it was my first uh, contribution to uh, come back to uh, the Python binding. I start to implement uh, quite a lot in this, uh, in this area, and I end up uh, to work only on Rust because I've fallen uh, in love with the language. And the community is really uh, welcome and benevolent for, with you because the, the learning curve is uh, pretty hard and you can take time to understand and to, uh, to, um, to manage the concept of ownership or the different libraries. But it was really uh, nice for, with, for, for me as a first experience with, uh, with Rust. And that's it. We value any contributions, and don't hesitate to reach uh, to us if you want to improve the Python bindings, the Rust, or any documentations. You have the Delta uh, Lake uh, Slack channel, and you can also follow the, the, the news on the LinkedIn page or directly contribute to the project. Uh, thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Uh, 
thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Uh, one question. So you said that Delta was sponsored or developed by Databricks at first, and you're not associated with Databricks in any way. How easy was it for you to to join the effort and uh, and become a, a maintainer of uh, the library? Yeah, good question. Thanks. Um, my first contribution was done on Delta iOS, which was created by Scribd. So my first entry point was Scribd uh, and the engineering team. They were really nice and uh, created like an awesome library. So we joined the effort. And right after, we will be joined by Databricks teams, uh, especially one developer advocate, which is Denny Lee. And it provides to me everything in terms of ownership, uh, flexibility by providing all the key of uh, Delta Lake. I was really surprised because you have like the full power of it, but I started to contribute more and more about uh, on, on this area. And yeah, the, the combination of two is really great because you feel like you, you'll be part of the open source community and you, you feel really, really well welcomed. Uh, and so it was really nice as an, an experience. And they continue to do the same with Delta Kernel. They create meetings with us and they uh, onboard more and more companies to help to define the future uh, about defining the, the barrier between Delta Kernel and Delta IRS. Uh, 